Dear uh, colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome you in this uh, postgraduate uh, courses. And today is a, it's a special day for, for many reasons. The first reason is, is the topic, which is uh, cardiovascular imaging. The second reason, and maybe the most important one, is that we have a very renowned speaker, uh, Dr. Kovalan Deepa from uh, United Kingdom, from, uh, from Cambridge University. And uh, third, but not uh, least, but not last, but not least, third, we have uh, Professor Yanakoulas, a professor of cardiology, and his uh, team to, to comment on, on, on those uh, things that uh, Dr. Kopalan will present. And uh, please allow me to give uh, uh, the, the microphone to Professor Kajidaitis to present our uh, invited speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Krasopoulos. It's really a great honor to have. Uh, Michael, Michael. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, to have uh, Dr. Gopalan with us today. Um, she's a famous uh, expert in radiology of thoracic area in general, especially of cardiac and uh, pulmonary diseases, and even more especially in the pulmonary hypertension uh, diseases. So uh, today uh, she will uh, give uh, two talks. Uh, one is about uh, cardiac CT and especially, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, pulmonary uh, artery hypertension CT uh, for thromboembolism. And after that, the second speech will be about cardiac MRI in pulmonary vascular disease. We will um, take some questions and comments after each presentation um, with the help of Professor Yanakoulas and his team. And after that, at the end, we will present uh, some cases, very interesting cases, which will be commented uh, by Dr. Gopala. So we start with the role of CTPA in pulmonary thromboembolism. So Deepa, please, you can take your mask uh, off. No, no, you can take it off. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Adam and the team for inviting me to come here today. And um, I have said this many times to Adam, but I just want to say I love Greece um, and Thessaloniki particularly has got a very special um, thing for me. So I'm very happy and honored to be here in the Aristotle University. So today, in the interest of time, I'll just get started. The first talk is on the role of CT in thromboembolic disease. Uh, how do I go forward, sir? Uh, let us let 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 Okay, fine. So the objectives of this talk are very simple. I'm going to show you the different patterns of thromboembolic abnormalities on CTPA. And I'm also going to show you how to gain the maximum information from the CT data set. So the diagnostic approach to CTPA, the very first thing is what you want to ask yourself as an imager is, is what I'm dealing with thromboembolic disease. And if it is, is it acute or chronic thromboembolic disease? Occasionally, you may have to deal with acute or chronic thromboembolic disease as one entity. You have to remember that it may not be thromboembolic disease at all, so you need to be aware that there are some mimics of this condition. And finally, the advantage of having a CT data set is you can also comment on alternate diagnoses such as acute aortic syndromes and acute coronary syndromes. So with this in mind, let's go forward. In the last decade, we've seen numerous advances in CT technology, some of which I've put on this slide. Basically, we are now able to get excellent image quality of the whole thorax in less than five seconds with improved radiation dosage to the patient. It's because of that that CTPA is considered as the gold standard, but just remember, it's the gold standard whether you have low or high clinical pretest probability. However, CTPA is not the gold standard for chronic thromboembolic disease, and I will show you why in the next few slides. So in order to interpret the CT, you need to know that there are important pathological differences between acute and chronic thrombus. So this is an example of acute thrombus 
you see that the thrombus is red, it's centralized, compared it to the chronic thromboembolic disease specimen on the right, it's very fibrous, it's dirty yellow in color. This is the specimen that has been endothelialized and is attached to the intima of the vessel. So radiologically, you're going to see differences when you deal with acute versus chronic disease. Let's have a quick recap of what you see in acute pulmonary embolism. So saddle embolus, which is where the embolism straddles the right and left main pulmonary artery, is not that common, but it's something that you will see two times in your career. More often than not, you're going to see a set of other uh, features. So you can have a intraluminal filling defect. When the defect is surrounded by contrast medium, you get the railway track sign or the polar min sign. The thrombus forms an acute angle with the vessel wall. The involved vessel is distended, similar to venous thrombus, and you can have complete occlusion. Remember, you can also look for ancillary features. So pulmonary infarction is the most important feature. This is the so-called Hampton's hump sign. You can have the so-called lacy infarct where you see these areas of ground glass change. This can cavitate with time. You can get fibrotic bands and you can also get pleuropericardial effusion. However, as a radiologist, your job does not stop with just saying there is acute PD you need to look for prognostication. And historically, the prognostication has been done as a subjective evaluation. But more recently, we are moving into objective quantification. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just sticking to a subjective evaluation because not everybody in the audience is a thoracic subspecialty person. So the RV is absolutely more than 38 millimeters is abnormal on a standard CTPA. But according to the published literature, when the RV size reaches more than 45 millimeters, it confers a worse prognosis. You measure the RV-LV ratio by looking at the widest diameter of the right ventricle, comparing it to the widest diameter of the left ventricle. Just remember, the widest diameter may not be on the same slice. You may have to go up and down your images. Um, more than 0.9 is abnormal, and a ratio of more than one confers worse prognosis. People ask me, how do I do these measurements? Do I do it on a standard transaxial slices, or do I need to get a dedicated cardiac slices? I would say to you that if you do a dedicated four chamber images by aligning your cardiac chambers to the mitral and tricuspid valve, you are introducing an extra level of complexity. There are enough studies to, to show with a standard transaxial slice, what you get is good enough, as long as it's not a research protocol. The other thing that I would urge you to look is at the interventricular septum. When you have increased pressure in the right ventricle, you get flattening of the septum or a leftward deviation of the interventricular septum. All of these features are increased risk for the patients to have uh, increased mortality at 30 days. Do not forget to look at the cardiac chambers. So in this example, this is still non-ECG-gated CT. You have acute pulmonary embolism, but if you look carefully, there is thrombus in the left atrium. If you look even more carefully, there is thrombus in the right atrium. So the thrombus has to get from the right to the left side. In order to do that, there needs to be a hole. And if you look carefully, there is your patent foramen ovale. So it's very important that you are looking for clots in transit. So you're not just looking at the pulmonary vasculature in isolation. You are looking at the cardiovascular and pulmonary vascular, all in tandem. Now, there are some controversies with acute PE. Do you go on to image the veins? Um, so this is an example, this is on first mortem, and you see that the inferior vena cava is distended with acute thrombus. Um, venography is easy to do. You can just increase your CTPA coverage to include the veins in the abdomen and pelvis, but the problem is the enormous increase in the gonadal radiation dose. So if you are worried about a venous thrombus in the abdomen, ultrasound is not a bad modality, CT and ultrasound are very concordant, except in the pelvic veins. I normally don't image the veins routinely unless you're going to put an IVC filter. What about searching for acute malignancy? So most of the times, pulmonary embolism is because a 
thrombus has broken off from the legs and has traveled to the lungs. Occasionally, you may have no DVT, but it's a de novo thrombus in the pulmonary circulation. So there is a three to four fold risk of malignancy in patients with a unprovoked PE. Should you then go and look for the malignancy, the available data that we have do not support that you go and do an extensive search. But what is important is you do age appropriate cancer screening. So if you've got a very young patient who has got not just pulmonary embolism, but other features that would suggest to you there is malignancy, by all means go in search of that. Now for the residents in the audience, what makes a good CTPA report? I think you should start by saying if the image quality is diagnostic. A lot of the times the diagnostic confidence of making a diagnosis of acute PE depends on the technical aspects of the the CTPA data set. So by all means state if the study is adequate for diagnosis. In addition, you should also make sure that you address the risk stratification. The pulmonary obstruction index, the PE index that people talk about, we don't routinely calculate it. It's more likely to be an estimated guest out. You have to comment on evidence of RV dysfunction. And if there is evidence of RV dysfunction, the patient should be prompted to go on and have echocardiography. And finally, make sure that you identify the presence of cardiac thrombus elsewhere in the rest of the circulation. We will now take a break from acute PE and move on to chronic thromboembolic disease. The fundamental difference is CTEPH, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, is a dual vascular disorder. You get the organized thromboembolic material in the large pulmonary arteries of the elastic type, which are greater than 0.5 millimeters. These are the thrombus that you can see on a standard CTPA because the axial restitution of a CT will allow you to do measurements and look at the delineation of thrombus in vessels up to two millimeters, but not less than that. You also get a secondary vasculopathy in the distal muscular pulmonary arteries, which are about 0.5 to 0.5 millimeters. This is difficult to see on a standard CT. So we will take one patient and follow their journey from acute to chronic disease. This is the same patient on the left, central thrombus, with time, the thrombus gets eccentric and it gets calcified. So the first feature of chronic thromboembolic disease is the presence of eccentric clot. When the thrombus, this is the acutely distended acute thrombus with inadequate recanalization, as in, in not complete resolution, you start to get these fibrotic bands of material left inside the vessel, and these are the so-called vets. Webs and stenosis can give you narrowing, but beyond the vessel, like any other part of the body, you will get post stenotic dilatation. If you then look at the webs, they have hinge points at multiple sites on the vessel wall. Histopathologically, you are looking at this thin structure that is attached to two sides of the vessel wall. They can be very difficult until you do multiplanar reconstruction. With Normal CT, you get a transition, a smooth transition as you go from proximal to distal. With chronic thromboembolic disease, you get abrupt truncation in the vessel caliber. Finally, switch over to lung parenchyma, and with chronic, you get what we call mosaic attenuation. Mosaic attenuation is very simply areas of black and white lungs. The gray areas are the normally perfused lung. The black areas are the lung areas that are not well perfused. One question is, could this be small airways disease? And the way to differentiate air trapping on expiration from pulmonary vascular disease causing mosaic attenuation is you look at the black areas and do the vessel count. You can see there is reduced vessels in the black area that tells you this is vascular rather than airways disease. Now, with acute PE, when you have shutdown of the pulmonary circulation, there is not enough time for the systemic collaterals to come into force. But with chronic thromboembolic disease, you get systemic collaterals, the bronchial arteries, which are branches of the iota. So if you see bronchial circulations lighting up on a CTPA, think, could this be acute on chronic or just chronic thromboembolic disease? Cardiovascular features, you are looking for dilated pulmonary artery. Make sure that you look at the ratio of pulmonary artery to the ascending iota. 
look at the right ventricle. Normally, the right ventricular wall should be less than three millimeters. So when you see four millimeters and above, it indicates that the ventricle is not just volume overloaded, but it's pressure overloaded. Also look at the interventricular septum and look for the contrast medium that is regurgitated into the IVC and the hepatic veins. Of course, signs of decompensation in the form of pluripericardial effusions. Now, this is a case where you have what looks like acute PE, very much like acute PE, but if you look very carefully, you have the presence of webs, you have the presence of right ventricular hypertrophy, and you have mosaic attenuation. So this is acute on chronic trauma embolic disease. This is not as rare as we think. Recent studies have shown between 5 to 10% of patients present into casualty for the first time actually have acute on chronic disease. The treatment is very different from acute PE, so it's important that you keep an eye for this. Now, CT, however good you are, is not infallible. There are going to be mimics. I'm just going to show you a couple. This is an example of a expansive material within the pulmonary artery. It, uh, it's very, very difficult to say if this is thrombus or not, but what I haven't told you is this patient has had three months of anticoagulation. There you have the bet that shows intensely increased uptake. This is pulmonary artery sarcoma. Another case where you have soft tissue thickening on either walls of the, uh, of the pulmonary artery, and if you look at their PET, there is systemic uptake in keeping with vasculitis. So multispectral CT is, is uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a spectral information, improved tissue characterization. So in addition to whatever you get on a standard CTPA, you're going to be able to get the pulmonary perfuse blood volumes. There are different ways of skinning the cat. I won't go through the technique, but I'm going to show you two examples. When you have a PE like this and you see perfusion defects, you're going to say, so what? You know, you can, a monkey can diagnose this. But when you have no PE up to segmental level, but your clinical suspicion of PE is high and you switch over to the dual energy mode, you can see perfusion defects. So this technique is very useful for small segmental and subsegmental thrombus. How does it work in chronic disease? you get two different patterns. A concordant pattern is when you have thrombus with perfusion de deficits, but you can also have the perfusion defects can be very different because bronchial circulation kicks in. So you may have occluded pulmonary arteries but preserved perfusion because the bronchial circulation is feeding that low. Uh, dual energy CT in chronic thromboembolic disease has also been shown to have corresponding uh, good correlation with the right heart catheter data. Finally, a word on artificial intelligence. In the context of thromboembolic disease, you can use it to triage your workflow, detect the disease, but most importantly, you can use it for risk stratification. Two ways of doing it, you can use your standard machine learning where you teach the system to make the diagnosis, but more importantly, you can use deep learning algorithms to extract data that are not visible to this normal eye. And I want to show you this because this is from 2007. So we are not dealing with AI last year or the year before. We've had this for about 10 plus years and CAD for acute PE works. It particularly works when you have junior doctors looking at the images, but it is not perfect. But as we speak, things are getting much more nuanced and the sensitivity and the specificity has gone up. But for those of you who are worried, this was a statement where they said in 2013, surgeons and physicians have a probability of 0.4% of being replaced by AI. We are still around, so I think we are okay. We just have to make sure that we use it in the best possible way. So I'm going to finish by saying it's important to appreciate that acute and chronic thromboembolic disease are two different entities. They have different pathological features and therefore different radiological features. When you're looking at a CTPA, don't just make the diagnosis, make a comment on the prognosis. And finally, wait for the AI algorithms. They're getting better and better. So hopefully, even next year, we'll be able to show you a few of the validated studies. I will stop there in the interest of time.
<laughs> so, congratulations, Diva. This was a great lecture on the, the role of CP, CPPA in particular in uh, both acute PE and the uh, CP uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So, if you have any uh, questions, first from the audience here, maybe yes. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, I would like to ask you something about the technical details of the technique. I mean, uh, what is the flow rate, the total volume of the contrast, and in which point do, do you place the tracer? Okay. Uh, okay. So the question that you asked very much depends. There are some standard things that I'm going to mention, but you will have to adapt it to the scanner that you have. Okay. We have a Siemens dual source and single source, but I'll just tell you about the single source because most people have a single source scanner, and it's a 120 detector size. So what we do is we put the cannula usually in the anticubital fossa, so a pink cannula and above. We give a 350 rather than 300 iodinated contrast medium. We inject it at uh, between 70 to 80 mils rather than below 50, as some papers suggest. Sometimes I even go up to 100 if needs be, and I inject it at a flow rate of 5 mils per second, followed by a saline chaser of 20 mils at 5 mils per second. In terms of iterative reconstruction, we always keep it on for radiation reduction. But uh, my institution does this based on a um, ROI placed bolus timing rather than uh, a test bolus. I only use test bolus for CTPA if I'm worried about a shunt because I don't know if the shunt direction is right to left or left to right. Otherwise, I just do an ROI and just get on from there. In terms of acquisition, we go cranial caudal rather than caudal cranial. That's purely based on the fact that some patients like it that way. Um, and we do it at an inspiration, but we tell patients not to do one salva. What is the total amount of contrast? Uh, between 70 to 80, but occasionally we go up to 100, not more than 100. It's too much. I'm going to try to first. To cut the first pass of the contrast, yeah. what is the total time of the scan? Ah, okay, so because remember that we have, you know, breathe in, breathe out, and all of the instructions, right? So by the time we come to the image for pulmonary vasculature and the home speed unit, we go at home speed unit of 130 rather than 100, okay? We are talking about a delay time of 12 seconds from the time we have injected. So if you think about normal pulmonary bath, so if you are injecting from the arm, your peak enhancement of the pulmonary vasculature is between eight to 10 seconds, and then the systemic vasculature is between 10 to 12 seconds, assuming there is no shunt and you have good capillary perfusion. So between the image at about 12 seconds after injection and the scan time is less than a minute. Thank you. Any other questions? Professor Koskos. Congratulations for all your attention. Uh, I want to comment about uh, RV dilatation between acute and chronic. How common is this in acute? We all know that it is yeah. common in chronic pulmonary uh, uh, can we just say that we can base our distinction on the RV dilatation? So the problem with just going by RV dilatation is you don't know the patient's pre-presentation condition. The patient, so you we know, trust our friend here. Yeah. When he says that is it. Yeah. Okay. But what I'm saying is that most people have COPD and they might have, you know, in from the community when you have people from the community. Rarely you might have patients with no prior history of cardiopulmonary disorders, okay? But sometimes patients with COPD might have dilated right ventricle for a variety of other reasons. So I go by the RV-LV ratio rather than by just dilatation of the RV. Well, anyway, anyhow, yeah. when you measure the, yeah. uh, when you assess the yeah. RV dilatation. Yeah, so um, you're asking how common it is. I see it in massive and submassive PE rather than in standard oil cases. So in my clinical practice, maybe 20% of the time I would see it, but you have to, 
uh, in acute, but you have to take it with a bit of bias because I only get to see the more complicated cases. I don't get to see, so it's like in my, because they show it to me when it's massive or submassive to ask if it's okay for catheter director thrombolysis because we have a per team. Yeah. No one. Uh, uh, in our institution, we do a, a scanning through of the cardiac sinus, which means that help us uh, have uh, a way of seeing it. Yeah, ECG gated. ECG, yeah. ECG. For CTPA. Yes. Okay. Do you have any comment on that? I think it's amazing that you do it because the cardiac pulsation artifacts, you're getting rid of a huge amount of artifacts, particularly in patients in tachycardia and all of that. And we only do it in certain groups of patients because um, not all the radiographers, we are a big institute, we are across three sites, and not all radiographers are willing to do ECG gated studies. Okay, <laughs> so it's mainly a technical reason rather than, you know. But I think if you're going to do it ECG gated, that's amazing because you can get information about the pulmonary artery distensibility. You can get so much more information than just a non ECG gated study. Especially the interventional. Yeah, every, you know, everything is better with ECG gated. Okay. Yeah. No, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can, can I make a, a short comment? Of course. Yes. Um, we've seen uh, occasionally some patients after a PPA procedure, yeah. some uh, strange vessels in CT. Yeah. So some, um, even with pulmonary angiography in basic. And uh, uh, we had recently a case for, uh, from a patient who was treated for ages uh, as a CTF. And the interventional cardiologist saw, uh, told us, okay, it, uh, it looks like uh, vasculitis. Uh, uh, vessels are distended, they have some aneurysms yeah. and the stenosis. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, is it uh, uh, related to the procedure itself or the chronicity of the disease, maybe? Yeah, so on? you get neovascularization with a variety of conditions and you get recruitment of vessels like pleural vessels, even gastric vessels. You get a lot of neovascularization, not just bronchial arteries. But um, if you see aneurysm, pulmonary artery aneurysms are not a common feature of chronic thromboembolic disease. So the word aneurysm is the only bit that I'm not liking. Stenosis, yes. Uh, recruitment, yes. This we see in chronic thromboembolic disease. But aneurysms per se is not a feature of CTEF, right? Post-stenotic dilatation, yes. But if you just have big segmental artery aneurysms, then I would worry about vasculitis like Bechet's disease. The PET scan. A PET would be helpful, but just remember with a PET scan, right? The patient has to have active vasculitic disease in order for it. PET may be false negative because the patient's ESR may be normal. So when you do the PET, as long as they have active vasculitis, you have you will have your answer because you're going to look for extra thoracic sites of vasculitis. I don't yeah. have a comment or a question. Uh, what about the bronchial arteries? You said that they may might be enlarged if pulmonary uh, embolism occur. And I had in the past also a case where there was anastomosis from uh, um, from peripheral pulmonary arteries from the right uh, coronary artery. Yeah. This could be also absolutely. Large. But what I would want to know in that situation is chicken and egg. Do they have coronary fistulas because they can drain into the pulmonary arteries? Okay. Or it can be, you know, it can be either way, but if you have occlusive pulmonary vascular disease and you see fistulas <laughs> going into the coronary arteries, then of course it's systemic collaterals, which can come from any vessel, like I mentioned, even from gastroepicloic vessels. But yeah. these are signs for chronic. Uh, yeah, it's chronic because it takes time to develop. <clears throat> okay. yeah. And this is another reason perhaps to see such fine structures to, to have the trigger in. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I did understand. <laughs> What? Okay. Let's okay. move now to the Let's second, the second okay. presentation. Okay. All right. So, so, cardiac MRI. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Fine. So this is a slight change of technique, but we are still sticking on to a similar topic. So what's the utility of cardiac MRI in pulmonary vascular disease? 
So the first thing to say is the pulmonary circulation and the right ventricle are one functional unit. They are not two separate entities. They are not two islands. They are very much a connected unit. So together, they form this low pressure, high capacitance system that's capable of accommodating large increases in blood flow with minimal changes in the pulmonary artery pressure. The image that's on the right is a Foley flow MRI, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on in the talk. Um, the right ventricle has got a very complex geometry. Those of you who do echo and MR will understand this. It's a very highly trabeculated, thin wall structure, but the normal RV is coupled to the pulmonary circulation in order to ensure transfer of blood from the pulmonary arteries in a very energy efficient fashion. This statement is important to understand a very important concept called the pulmonary artery to right ventricular coupling. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little further on in the talk. So comprehensive evaluation by cardiac MR. MR is the reference standard for biventricular function, but it's also most importantly, gives you an excellent understanding of the right ventricular structure and function. In the context of pulmonary vascular disease, MR angiography is very important. It allows you, for a start, to differentiate thromboembolic disease from pulmonary arterial hypertension, but it also has got uses in other diseases of the pulmonary vasculature. You get abundant functional data from MRI, so much so that you could use it as a surrogate imaging biomarker. Finally, it's a very flexible research tool with excellent inter and intra observer variability that allows you to use the technique to understand the pathophysiology behind the disease processes. Normally, when you look at a cardiac MR, it's got a high spatial and temporal resolution with no radiation. This is a short axis view, and you are looking at the right and the left ventricle, and you can see that the left ventricle contracts like a donut, but the right ventricular fibers are orientated differently. So in order to look at the right ventricle, it's better to look at it in a transaxial way in order to understand that the right ventricle contracts in a longitudinal fashion. Now, the generic features of pulmonary hypertension are very simple. So you get right-sided chamber dilatation, that's the distended right atrium of the right ventricle, which is hypertrophy. You can look and quantify the extent of tricuspid regurgitation and also RV systolic function. Now, you obviously see uh, pericardial effusion. Now, you will see this in any cause of pulmonary hypertension, so it's a very generic feature. Um, the interventricular septal configuration, as we discussed, is important. As the pulmonary artery pressure worsens, the right ventricle contracts much more slowly compared to the left ventricle. This results in what we call uh, in, impairment of the ventricular dependency between the right and the left ventricle. This impairment results in either flattening or bowing of the interventricular septum. And what this results is a small underfilled left ventricle. Let's just go. So as the pulmonary vascular resistance increases, the stroke volume from the right side reduces. This results in reduced filling of the left heart chambers, and you get this so-called characteristic D-shaped ventricle. Now, uh, if you give gadolinium, you can look for signs of RV remodeling. This is insertion site fibrosis. It is not a specific finding. You can see it in a variety of diseases. But when you have a patient with pulmonary hypertension and you see late gadolinium enhancement in the insertion sites, it has been shown to have a negative correlation with the RV function. Now, with MR, one major advantage is the ability to interrogate the pulmonary vasculature. If this is the first pass technique, you give gadolinium and you follow it as it goes through the different structures within the thoracic cavity. The perfusion has got superior temporal and spatial resolution. Now, how does it compare with existing perfusion modalities? This is a still image from the same perfusion that I showed you before, and you see these wedge-shaped areas of perfusion. The volume rendered MR matches very well with the concordant VQ standards, the more traditional way of looking at the pulmonary perfusion. The addition of MR perfusion, you can get quantification, so it's a much more useful technique. Now, MR angiography, so you go one step 
beyond the perfusion and you do a bolus administration of gadolinium and you get the data in one single breath hold. And there are two ways of looking at the data. This is just looking at the raw data and you can do this in coronal, axial or sagittal modes. I like looking at it in so-called maximum intensity projection. This is a rotating maximum intensity projection and it's incredibly useful to look at the various features of the different parts of the pulmonary vasculature. Okay. Now, how can we use this technique to differentiate different conditions affecting the pulmonary vessels? The main uh, way that we use uh, MR angiography is to differentiate chronic thromboembolic disease from other causes of pulmonary hypertension. I won't go through the signs because you already know the signs. In idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension or any other cause of PAH, the group one PH, you get the you get these smooth vessels, but they come to a stop and the last two centimeters of the lung parenchyma does not have any vessels in it. So this lack of peripheral perfusion is called peripheral bruning, which is a uh, sensitive, but not a specific feature of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Another example, there is a soft tissue structure here, which is intraluminal, but if you look carefully, you don't see the back wall of the pulmonary vasculature because this thing has come out into the mediastinum. If you look at the pulmonary segmental vessels, they have what we call a beaded appearance. This is a case of pulmonary arterial metastases. Now, we can also use uh, the technique to look at uh, pre and post uh, treatment. So these are pre endarterectomy this is post endarterectomy and we can also quantify it in addition to looking at the MR and geography. It's incredibly powerful technique if you want to follow up without any radiation dose. Now we come to 4D flow technique. It's not just pretty pictures. They do have a lot of meaningful conclusions. So the fourth dimension, if you're wondering what it is, is time. So these are time results, three directional uh, uh, velocity encoded acquisition. And what it's been shown is the presence of these flow vortices has got a good sensitivity and specificity for picking up early diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So subclinical pulmonary hypertension can be picked up with this technique. Now, it's been shown that the duration of the vortices coincide with the pulmonary artery pressure. Um, a still image here, you should normally have linear flow and you see these vertical flows. The reason why it hasn't been taken up by the clinical community outside of meetings is the post-processing is tedious. So it's time consuming and there is no consensus. And it's only recently in the last year or so that people have started using commercially available software. Previously, it was done by in-house software. But now that we have a commercial software, you're going to see more of this, hopefully, in your routine practice. There are a variety of parameters that we can measure with MRI, but the truth is, none of them are accurate enough to replace right heart catheterization. So however good you are as an MR imager, you still need right heart catheterization in order to work out what's happening to the hemodynamics. Um, a note on strain, I told you at the beginning of the talk that it's a very topical issue. Coupling, the right ventricular pulmonary artery coupling is a, a way of looking at the right ventricular afterload and contractility. And when you have uncoupled right ventricle to PA dynamics, you can identify patients who will have poor prognosis. Um, you measure couple, coupling on MRI with the help of strain images. You can, of course, do it on echo, but this is an MR talk, so I'm just concentrating on MR measurements of RV strain. A paper from a couple of years ago from Germany, they looked at 38 patients with different varieties of pulmonary hypertension, six of whom had chronic thromboembolic disease, and they worked out that the right ventricular global longitudinal strain of greater than negative, you measure strain in negative values, negative 15.2 at a 70% sensitivity, but a better specificity for measuring uncoupling. In my unit, we looked at strain, and this paper has been submitted. Um, so this is a patient with chronic thromboembolic disease, and what you see is the atrial strain, but we also looked at biventricular and biatrial strain. Now, in good 
Responders who had a better prognosis, the strain improved from pre-op to post-op. And this improvement in strain correlated with improvement in their six minutes walk distance, as well as in the pulmonary artery pressures. Uh, and you can see significant improvement, 50 to 70 millimeters. The pulmonary vascular resistance dropped from 16.7 to a normal mm -hmm. value of one good unit. So it's a non-invasive technique. It's coming and many units are now starting to do it. It's as yet not validated with prospective trials, but hopefully you will see more of this in the future. And we think that the right ventricular global longitudinal strain is much more sensitive than just using ejection fraction. For those of you who do cardio-oncology, people are moving away from working out whether you replace your blood with the help of ejection fractions and you're using global longitudinal strain because it's a much more sensitive way of working out your response to treatment. Finally, a note on AI. In the UK, we have a biobank. So we have looked at normal geometry and motion. Um, from Imperial about a few years ago now, we published that using machine learning pattern in the context of pulmonary hypertension, the AI <coughs> prediction was much better than traditional risk factor prediction. So just to end this talk, there is an enormous potential for using different parameters with MRI for screening, diagnosis, and therapy follow-up. But we still have a problem in access to MRI and the time that it takes to do a procedure. Remember, digital images are more than just pretty pictures. There is a lot of mineable data, and in implementation of AI-based software is going to help you extract all of that data that we can't see with normal eyes, but of course it requires multi-center validation. With that, I'm going to stop on this section and we'll take questions. We're about to get the lecture deeper. Any comments first from the audience about the role of CMR? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, if you had the opportunity to choose between uh, CCPA and CMRA. Which one would you choose? Um, for what condition? What am I looking for? Uh, for this patient. For chronic 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 I truly would just do CT because it's simple, it's easy, and I can get a lot of the information that I need. Uh, even for pre-operative pre-procedural planning, even to provide a roadmap. And the second question is uh, in the routine basis. Yeah. How often do you use face uh, contrast imaging for the evaluation of the space? Every patient. Every, Every patient. patient. Now, and 4D flow is my routine as well. And roots of pulmonary artery, branch pulmonary artery, and iota. So and I do yeah, yeah. no, not pulmonary veins. So I do iota for systemic vessels. I do main, right and left PA for uh, pulmonary vessels. I do not do pulmonary vein because that's much more difficult. <laughs> I know. That's why, <laughs> that's why so, I'm no, asking. No, we published one paper from Papua long time ago, and it was uh, there was absolutely no correlation with anything because there is so much variability with the veins. Yeah, maybe with AI. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> I see some comments uh, from the, also congratulations. I see from the Zoom as well. So there are a lot of participants from the Zoom, Professor Kadidakis. We have uh, yeah. some uh, comments. I see yes. that Dr. Zikas is connected. So I will dare to ask an uh, interventional question about uh, chronic. Uh, disease and uh, difference uh, of balloon dilatation and um, uh, surgical reconstruction because I, th I think the first of all the interventional uh, balloon dilatation is needs a lot of sessions needs a lot of doses for patients and doctors and uh, is not always for a long period of time. Uh, so is perhaps the tendency right now to to, to prefer surgical uh, 
and uh, and our director me it's not uh, real artery but yeah. you know yeah. what i mean uh, first of all hello to dr zakis zikas i it's a pity i missed you but hopefully i'll see you in the future meetings so to answer your question um it's the pulmonary endarterectomy has been around for 20 plus years lots of literature backing it when you have disease that is proximal and what's proximal and what's distal is very much dependent on the surgeon who's operating or an established surgeon who's been doing this procedure and they can get up to the segmental vessels okay? that's proximal disease the literature is you can get complete cure okay but pulmonary angioplasty has been around um as a viable technique for the last five seven years and uh, the japanese literature uh, in japan they don't do that much surgery they do more angioplasty so there are lots of literature from japan their literature is it works in their patient group but um, the nobody had done a direct comparison between uh, bpa versus uh, pte but probably trauma in our rectomy but now we have the race study from france which are doing the uh, randomized trials uh, the bpa i think for interventional cardiologists bpa is the balloon pulmonary angioplasty for interventional cardiologists the interventional radiologists who are doing it it's an exciting procedure but uh, it is you can't do all of the structures in one go you have to do a staged procedure so there is a real concern of radiation for the operator and for the patients but we are talking about a disease that if you don't treat they will die so on a risk benefit ratio you need to do something um i think for bpa um it is not in evolution there are lots of consensus about how to do it that's not my problem my problem is you don't at this point in time get normalization of the pressures having said that can you do hybrid imaging where you do the proximal vessels with pte and you do your distal vessels with your balloon pulmonary endarterectomy absolutely there are patients who do not want to have surgery or who cannot have surgery because of comorbidities bpa is perfect for them so i think as a procedure we should encourage it but in a small group of hands because you need to practice in order to get better and the disease is a rare disease so you can't do one per year you need to concentrate the expertise and the experience in maybe one or two centers i think we have thank you very much thank i you. think we have two questions one from uh, dr xino and another one from uh, dr zikas think uh, yes excellent presentations thank you very much and the apostolos cannot turn on camera and video but maybe next oh, okay time. no no i'm here Ah, hello, oh, Apostolos. Hello. Hello. Yes. hello. Where are you, Apostolos? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. So I travel a lot, uh, like, like in the past. Now, uh, excellent lectures. I just uh, wanted to make a comment uh, that uh, this is not, uh, the question is not whether we do this or that. The question is uh, whether we can work as a team. Uh, and this is uh, what I've learned from uh, Professor Yanakoulas and his uh, uh, fellows. And also with the collaboration with uh, Adam, that uh, we need to work together and we need to discuss each uh, patient and then find the best option. Right now, we started doing some cases in uh, Ahepa University Hospital. So we hope to cover the North Greece. And there are quite a few patients that need the BPA. And the decision is made uh, after a discussion. And uh, usually, the, the gold standard we say is uh, endarteriectomy, especially with proximal disease. But in the middle vessel disease, uh, then there is an overlap and we discuss each patient and then we try to find the best uh, solution. But what we have seen from uh, data from Athens, from uh, Panagiotis Cardiophilis, where I, I went and did my training, is that uh, the patient can, be, can get really well. Uh, the pressures can get normal. Very good. Yeah. So for me, as an interventional cardiologist, I do many other things. But uh, the most exciting part is uh, that uh, you can really cure uh, uh, people and uh, so I think uh, with this collaboration uh, all together we can we can make a difference. So thank you very much. Well, all the best. Yeah. Good luck. Although you have a black cat on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and just a final uh, question before the, the, the cases. Uh, we've seen some uh, publications over the 
seven, ten years for the role of uh, talking about MRI in the pulmonary hypertension, about the, the role of uh, uh, RV ejection fraction, talking about idiopathic mainly. But uh, do you think we can extrapolate these findings in the CTF? The, because we know that the prognostic role is very important, but you know it's very difficult to do routinely CMR in all of our patients. Do you think we should start doing the um, CMR routinely if we have it in all patients with uh, maybe CTF, inoperable CTF for the uh, residual CTF after surgery? Yeah, but remember, you, if you're just going to want RVEF right and you have a good echocardiographer, they can give you the answer. But if you want to go one above that and you want strain, you can do 3D echo and you can get the strain. So I think for MRI, it very much depends on the access that you have. It's a good technique, but if you are limited in terms of access to MRI, I think you fine tune your echo to get all the information. Then we can move to the last session. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Shachoglu, who is a fellow, uh, PH fellow, in our clinical fellow in our department, we present the four brief cases uh, that we encountered over the last uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Maybe. Hello, everybody. Welcome, uh, Dr. Kopan. I'm going to start the presentation uh, about the, our four clinical cases. I'm going to start the presentation. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation of our clinical cases. Uh, regarding the first clinical case, a 40 year old male um, was referred to our outpatient clinic uh, due to. Uh, Symptoms and signs of right heart failure. He had been hospitalized multiple times for uh, to compensate with the right heart failure. Uh, at the time of the referral, he was uh, classified at uh, functional class four, uh, which means that he had symptoms even at rest. Uh, he was obese with a BMI of 40. He was somnolent and he had uh, he had been hospitalized twice for pulmonary embolism. He was on medical treatment with anticoagulant, uh, with uh, heart failure treatment, bronchodilators, and oxygen therapy. So we uh, ordered an echocardiography, uh, which revealed uh, no signs of left heart disease, but we can see the flattening of the intraventricular septum. Uh, that means that we have uh, high pressures in the RV. We can see enlargement of the red chambers. And the systolic pressure of the RV was cal calculated high at 64 millimeters. We can also see the inferior vena cava dilated and um, uh, with reduced uh, respiratory variation. That means that we have high pressure on the uh, right atrium. So the next step was to order a Q line scan. Uh, we um, detected the uh, defects of the fusion defects, mainly in the left lower lobe. And then we uh, proceed with a CTPA. And I, would, okay. and I would like the uh, help of Dr. Gopala to sure, sure. yeah. comment on this. So as we are going through, you see the right side of the chamber dilatation, the reverse septal curvature, the patient has had a gastric banding, you can see there is increased contrast in the azygous uh, circulation there. And as you come up, you can see complete occlusion of the left lower lobe. There is also disease in the lingula, segmental disease in the lingula. You can see the bronchial collaterals there and the right pleural effusion. If you switch over to the lung windows for me. Yes. So it's bilateral disease, but worse on the left side, and you've got proximal disease distribution. So you've got a patient who's got classic features of CT. It's important when you're looking at the lung windows to make sure that they are not emphysematous. Okay. When you have big bullous emphysema and you subject these patients to surgery, you're opening up areas of lungs. 
that are effectively got no ventilation. So it's important to look for comorbidities on the lung growing camera, but in this you don't have anything. So there is a nice proximal CT test. The only problem is the patient is obese. It doesn't mean he can't have a surgery. It just makes everything a little bit difficult. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Some more uh, aimating here. Yeah. And you see very beautifully the distended yeah. venous circulation, the azagus circulation is very distended. You can see the hemiazagus crossing the azagus at the level of the diaphragmatic hiatus and lots and lots and lots of systemic collapses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem with space, the discount is patients twice. Yeah. And because we didn't have, uh, uh, we used the user protocol. Yeah. But we didn't have a good classification uh, of the ventricles and the pulmonary venous vasculator. The question was how it can happen. In both examinations, we had uh, the same uh, view. Yeah. First, the collateral were uh, classified, yeah. and later on, the uh, yeah. ventricles and the pulmonary arteries. So the question is, can the pulmonary hypertension can uh, cause that extensive uh, venous, we're talking about venous collaterals instead of uh, arterial collaterals? What I would want to know is did he have venous thromboembolism that occluded this IDC? Why has he got such big azimus and hemi azimus? From the, from the axis, we don't yeah. see any thrombus. Yeah, but, but what I was wondering was if he had, had multiple episodes of DVT and he had better yeah. between the occlusions, could he have had tablet? Because normally you don't see as it is an any as it is to this extent. So because he's got chronic trauma and body disease, I'm wondering if he had pelvic venous occlusions, which resulted in lots of collateral formation. But whatever it is, you have a problem because you're not seeing that good in a classification. The images are diagnostic, they are not pretty because I can still see the occlusions, right? And um, what I would do in that instance is instead of bolus tracking, I would do a test bolus and I would also do a delayed phase, you know, two phase acquisition. I know it's increased radiation, but uh, you have to get diagnosis. We did uh, yeah. diagnose the patient, but we couldn't explain this yeah. Uh, tree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wonder the tree uh, is because of pelvic occlusions, but yeah. On the next, yeah. we, we, can, we can see some collaterals so first, second on the top, okay? Yeah. To the red and on the spine was great. If we go here, yeah. you will see some collaterals that are probably from uh, intercostal veins and yeah. also in the paraspondyl area. Yeah. Uh, can this uh, develop because of the, the whole situation? I think the systemic collaterals, both arterial and venous. One yeah. question I have for the clinician is, he has not previously had any venous intervention. As far as we know, no venous intervention. Okay, because sometimes I see these crazy collaterals. You have seen these collaterals. I've seen these collaterals, but crazy collaterals when you have pacemakers, you know, chronic pacemakers, and they get all kinds. I see it in patients who have renal impairment and fistulas and all of that, but your patient is de novo. They haven't had anything. But if you haven't imaged the abdomen, I would say make sure that you image the abdomen to look for venous occlusions in the pelvis. Okay. Yeah. So next step was to order a right heart catheterization. It will be able to uh, confirm the diagnosis of precapillary pulmonary hypertension with a mean uh, pressure in pulmonary artery at 40, uh, 45 and high uh, vascular pulmonary vascular resistance is at uh, 5 good units. And uh, then a pulmonary angiography was ordered in order to correlate the findings of CTPA with the findings in pulmonary angiography and to uh, proceed to the operability assessment of the patient. And, we, and here we can see the occlusion of the vessel here. Uh, 
to the lower left block. So uh, the treatment was a uh, pulmonary endotherectomy in December 2021. He, our patient had clinical improvement. Uh, we repeated the right heart, heart, heart catheterization three months after the uh, successful PPA. Uh, he, uh, <coughs> the pressure of the pulmonary artery um, was at uh, 29, uh, and the, we have a um, uh, we have uh, low pulmonary vascular resistance is at uh, below uh, one uh, wood unit. And they, we had uh, also uh, improvement in cardiac index. And before you go to case to one question, uh, did he have a longer intensive care stay unit because of his comorbidities? I think I know. Yes, the patient was not operated here, but uh, we know that patient stayed in the CCU yeah. for a uh, Two weeks and it was very extraordinary yeah. procedure due yeah. to the morbid obesity. Yeah. Okay. Or to call Peter. That's not help. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, regarding the second clinical case, a 39 year old female uh, was referred to our outpatient clinic uh, for her uh, follow up assessment uh, three months after an episode of hypothyroid pulmonary embolism. At the time of the referral, she was. Um, at uh, functional class three. Uh, regarding her past medical history, she uh, suffered from uh, beta thalassemia. Uh, she was on. Uh, she has been on treatment with transfusion since uh, she was uh, two years old, and she had splenectomy at the age of fifteen. Splenectomy is a risk factor for CTF, as all we know. And uh, an echocardiography was ordered. Uh, we can see the flattening of the intermediate septum. We can also see the enlargements of the uh, red chambers. Short acceleration time in the pulmonary valve, uh, indicative of uh, high pulmonary vascular resistance. And the systolic pressure of the RV was calculated at uh, 74. A vacuum lung scan was ordered. Uh, the perfusion showed uh, multiple defects, both sides, left and right pulmonary uh, uh, lobes. The ventilation was normal. And then I would like your tail to comment. Yeah, so if you just let it run. So the first thing to say is she's got two reasons to have pulmonary hypertension, splenectomy, so she could have thromboembolic disease. She's got thalassemia, which gives you uh, it's like a group five pulmonary hypertension, distended and uh, heavily trabeculated RV, dilated RA, flattened septum. I'm looking at the vessels, and uh, as we go, the proximal, the lower bar vessels and the proximal segmental vessels look okay. But obviously, she's had splenectomy, so we need to look for particularly distal thromboembolic disease, proximal vessels look okay. If you switch over to the lung windows, uh, what I want to see is the presence of mosaic acceleration because that will tell me whether she's got thromboembolic disease or not. And as we go through, yeah, you start to see proximal perfusion is preserved, but as you go more beyond the third segmental vessels, you get more areas of darkness. You can stop there. So I would wonder whether this is thromboembolic disease predominantly in a distal distribution, but important to say, this is the reason why CT is not the gold standard for chronic thromboembolic disease, because she's got pulmonary hypertension, but you're not really seeing anything within the pulmonary vasculature, right? But the VQ scan is very convincing. She's got mismatch perfusion defects, Okay. So you would propose another kind of imaging here? Uh, no, you, I think you have your answer, but you can do catheter pulmonary angiography to ensure that you're not missing this total thromboembolic disease. But here is this mismatch with the periphery, so that it's uh, getting poor. Uh, reduced perfusion yeah. in the periphery, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we can see more imaging. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you can see a little bit of reds here, there, there yeah. yeah, there is reds, yeah. You can see the uh, non-occlusive. It's not completely occlusive. You see flow on either side of the reds, and you will be caught out with these webs because um, the radio trace that you give, MAA, for a VQ scan is so tiny that they can get past these webs. So when you look at the Q scan, the perfusion doesn't look that bad, but the family vascular resistance is high because they have got these webs. And right heart catheterization was ordered and it uh, confirmed the pulmonary uh, hypertension. Okay, and then we proceed to the pulmonary angiography. We can see multiple perfusion defects on both sides. It is a distal CT. We cannot see central only. And the, our person started BPA procedures. Also was put on the real sigma, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And continue with the. Uh, uh, yeah, just just one second. If you go into this, they've started the PPA procedure. So obviously, you're going to uh, look at those areas, particularly the left side where you have a few webs. Have you have you done two, three attempts of the PPA? I think uh, she, she has uh, a couple of procedures in Athens. Yeah. So we, she will not read it in our center. Okay. Three sessions. Three sessions already. Three sessions. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I don't, we don't have details on, on the income group. So, one thing for the trainees in the group um, when you have generic features of pulmonary hypertension, you cannot see anything in the proximal pulmonary arteries, but you see mosaic attenuation. It is CETA. Nothing else gives you that degree of mosaic attenuation. So continue with the third clinical case. Um, we have a 42-year-old uh, female. Uh, regarding her past medical history, she suffers from diabetes, type 1. She, is on dialysis for the last, she has been on dialysis for the last six years due to diabetic nephropathy. And she, had, and she has an IV dialysis catheter. And she, at the time of the referral, she has a persistent dyspnea on excision for the last month. And she is a full function of class 3. Uh, her BMI is at 37. Um, we here we have findings of the, from the echocardiography. Again, the T-shape, we can see the T-shape of the LV uh, due to high pressures in the right uh, ventricle. The uh, systolic function of the RV uh, is borderline at 70 millimeters. And we have short acceleration time due to high pulmonary vascular resistances. And we um, had the opportunity to measure echocardiographically the main pump at 38 millimeters. And this is so the pressure of the airway was high at 64. And here is uh, the uh, QLAN scan. Uh, she had, it revealed uh, multiple uh, defects. Perfusion defects mainly in the right medial lobe and the left lower lobe. The right heart catheterization confirmed the precapillary uh, pulmonary hypertension. The figures are high at 8.9 volt units. Uh, very low cardiac index at uh, 1.9. And here okay. we have the image. So you see less dots immediately that should tell you that there is something happening in the pulmonary vasculature. And uh, you can see, uh, let's see, keep looking up. Yeah. So there is attenuated vessels as you go in the mid segment. Um, there's bronchial collaterals. Could you just loop it so that we can see, yeah. The right apex, can you see there is no dots, so there is disease in the both right and left side. Okay. And keep coming, and I'm going to ask you to stop for a moment. Just at, okay, just stop there, just stop there. Okay, so there is a sign that I haven't mentioned thus far, which is called the pulmonary vein sign. All the time we are looking at the pulmonary arteries, we're not looking at the pulmonary veins. If you look at the right inferior pulmonary vein, you can see, uh, yeah, you can see flow artifact there. 
Okay, the presence of flow artifacts in the pulmonary vein sign, this is the PBS sign, in the cortex of thromboembolic disease, it's uh, got higher frequency in chronic thromboembolic disease compared to RPD. <coughs> it's an important sign to look at. It has only been described recently, but it's another sign to look out for. You don't see pulmonary vein sign in pulmonary arterial hypertension. You see it in thromboembolic disease, but not in the age. Okay, keep going. Uh, you can switch over to lung windows. That's fine. So small areas of peripheral, uh, small infox, presumed infox. You can see that the interatrial septum is bored, like an aneurysmal interatrial septum because of the high PA pressures. Um, I'm also looking for intracardiac shunts, but she doesn't look like she's got any intracardiac shunts. The pulmonary venous anatomy is normal. So you've got someone who has got a significant pH, attenuated vessels, and the differential for you is, is this PAH or is it distal CTF? Both of which can give you uh, VQ defects. Okay, so you can get PAH as well giving you a mismatch perfusion, not as common as CTEP, but you can have it. So I would definitely say you would need pulmonary angiography, capital pulmonary angiography. And yeah. Oh yeah, there you go, lovely stenosis there. Yeah, in the very first you have that narrowing. Yeah, yeah, lovely stenosis with a bit of post genotic dilatation. So you can see how having three-dimensional, you know, a multiplanar imaging helps you to see these better than transaxial views. And here is the yes. pulmonary angiography. So you have mixed disease, and um, you see areas where there are some truncation, but you also see, so in, when you do catheter pulmonary angiography, in order to see the stenosis and the webs, better to do a perpendicular view, Compared, yeah, so you have your perpendicular view there, okay? And you see the perfusion defects like we saw before, yeah. Uh, so the patient uh, underwent a uh, uh, BPA, yeah, and this is a little low, yeah, uh, a severe stenosis, yeah, and uh, this is the post dilatation uh, result. Uh, yeah. We have a uh, Store of, uh, restoration on uh, uh, the, the distal yeah. uh, uh, pulmonary yeah. arteries. Uh, this uh, is the final result. I yeah. think it's very impressive. It is, yeah. Yes. It is very impressive. Uh, then we uh, perform a uh, VP to the lower lobes. Yeah. Uh, this is the first uh, images before the VPA. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the final result uh, after the procedure. And uh... Theophilus, can I make a comment here? Hello? Yes, of course. So what is important when we do these procedures is that uh, we go uh, very carefully because the, the environment where we're working is uh, hostile, I might say. Uh, with a mean pressure of 53, anything uh, any little um, perforation can result in a disaster. So we go with small balloons. Uh, we treat the lesions, uh, expecting not a very, uh, not an excellent uh, angiographic result, but uh, we open. Uh, we, we try to to give to the some flow there, and then the high pressure will do the rest of the job. So uh, the acute results that you see may not be so impressive uh, in terms of uh, restoration of the the wall of the vessel, as you see it acutely. But uh, in the second, uh, in the next session, when we go back and uh, do an angio, we see that we have uh, much improvement. And one important thing to observe is the, the venous uh, return. I think it was in a previous image uh, in a lower lobe that we had, uh, uh, I think it's here, that we see that uh, originally we had no venous return. And then after the balloon uh, dilatation, we had the uh, uh, venous return. Okay. 
Now we did, uh, we did this uh, on the, the first session was uh, four lesions with small balloons and then we plan to do the, the left lung, uh, I think next week. So do you pre-dilate with a smaller balloon? We pre-dilate with uh, 220s only, this one. Okay, okay. So the venous return that he's talking about on the angiogram, that's why on the CT, you look at the waves, pre-op, you see decreased flow. And if you image them post-op, the venous return improves. So it's a very mechanical sign, but it's an important <laughs> sign to remember. In the last case, um, regarding the last case, uh, we would have a 75 year old female um, in our outpatient clinic. Um, she was referred because of her symptoms. He had, she had this male exertion. Uh, regarding her past medical history, she suffered from arterial hypertension and diabetes mellitus. She had comorbidities. And the interesting point in this uh, case is that the initial diagnosis was um, who it would have in mind that maybe she, she might have a palmarial hypertension with comorbidities. Um, we ordered uh, an echocardiography. Uh, it showed all the signs of pulmonary hypertension. And then we uh, proceeded uh, to the vacuum lung scan. And uh, from her chest x rays, she had an atelectasis in the um, uh, right uh, lower lobe. Uh, so she had an abnormal uh, ventilation scan, and she, but she also, however, she also had a, an abnormal uh, perfusion lung scan. Uh, but uh, because we didn't have the mismatched beds, uh, the uh, perfusion scan was non-diagnostic for us for for the possibility for the probability of the CT. So we um, uh, ordered a CTPA. <clears throat> so you can see webs in the right lower lobe. Mm -hmm. uh, as you go, uh, she's got some bronchitis some intimal thickening on the right side. And there is what looks like an acute clot as well in the right upper lobe. Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been looking at the left side, but if you want to switch over to the lung windows, we can see what it looks like. Yeah. So you don't see webs in IPH or in any pH. Mm -hmm. So if you see webs, you have your answer. and the lungs are not normal. And we already know she has a web disease in the right lower lobe in the posterior segment. I'm now looking at the left side. Uh, there, there is a web in the anterior segment and the anterolateral segment of the left side. And... Okay, that's fine. You see plenty of uh, mosaic continuation. So this is not IPAH. This is chronic thromboembolic disease. Probably have a small component of acute, but predominantly there is chronic disease. Yep. So we see the acute in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe, but you also see other elements of chronicity. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Make it five. Yeah. And you see the abrupt tapering, so acute on chronic disease, yeah. Okay. And then we order the right heart catheterization. and the probably after three months of adequate Yeah. Okay. And the right heart catheterization could be confirmed the uh, requirement of hypertension. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question for you. I know you are a congenital unit. I've seen your latest publication on the bronchial artery embolization in patients with hemoptysis. I saw that one. But can I ask you a question? How often, or in your practice, how frequently do you see inside your thrombus 
that gets confused for chronic thromboembolic disease? This is a great question, actually. We had the, we, uh, when I was in the Brompton, uh, in London, we had the, I think, I think it was Brompton, uh, I'm not sure it was more than 10 years ago, and they performed the trial on uh, contemporary cases the Brompton. They found a very high percentage of, of uh, 20%, but I think in the current era of better uh, uh, PAH therapy, and the uh, patients are treated much better in uh, expert centers, I think the incidence is much lower. So maybe 10% or one out of 10, but uh, after long stem PAH and uh, in more uh, disease patients. So do you anticoagulate? Oh, that's, a, this, <laughs> that's, that's a great one because we had, we had this case, disastrous case with a uh, patient who was anticoagulated. Yeah. He had an inside thrombosis, was put on anticoagulation, had a massive hemoptysis. So, you know, you have and to- And you have to go to them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to wait between, between hemoptysis, bleeding and uh, thrombosis. So, uh, Professor has like to make comment on the case. It was a challenging case uh, that did uh, the bronchial embolization. But who's an easy one? No, oh, it's easy. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but for the trainees in the audience, if you see, it's a mimic. So if you see big pulmonary arteries and you see thrombus, look at the size of the segmental vessels. With chronic thromboembolic disease, the segmental vessels are shrunken, so you get smaller and smaller as you go from proximal to distal. With inside to thrombus, in the context of pulmonary arterial hypertension, you get big segmental vessels. So if you have thrombus and big segmental vessels, think if they could have an underlying congenital shunt. And there have uh, been reported cases that patients went to surgery and they died. You know. yeah. So, because they, somebody called it as chronic rather than recognizing that there was a shunt. Yeah. So, should we end the meeting with Professor Prasopoulos? Yes, uh, thank you. It was a very a spectacular session. We learned a lot, and the discussion was very, very rich. Uh, so, I would like to thank you uh, for your two talks that are nice. I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Professor Yanakoulos and his team for the cases, uh, for Professor Kuskuras and Professor Kajidakis for their comments. Uh, I think that it was a spectacular session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.